Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Nolan V. Bivens, who serves as president and CEO of Americans for the Arts. Nolan, welcome to the show. Thank you so very much. I'm really excited to be here with you and your audience today. I can't tell you how much this means to us and the organization at all. Uh, well, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. And, you know, in some ways, I wish we had, you know, double or triple our usual time uh, uh, because I think your leadership is is uh, is is new for several, you know, people in our audience and constituencies and, of course, representing, you know, our nation's arts organization in many ways um, that people are really interested in the work that that's happening. Um, and so I thought I would just kind of start right off that you bring this unique background to your role, having a military background, um, specifically in the Army, and, um, and have been an extraordinary leader your entire career, your entire life. Um, and, but the idea of bringing that experience into arts organizations, um, for some, is kind of like, oh, so tell us about that. And you know, kind of what's your perspective on the arts? Um, and I know obviously you have been very instrumental, no pun intended, in a lot of arts connecting with the military and a lot of, and you firsthand have seen the impact of the arts as it relates to the military. Um, but I thought I would just kind of give you an opportunity to kind of share with our audience, kind of how do you view that? And are there aspects from your background that you feel um, uh, are helpful to you in this leadership role at AFTA? Clearly, without a doubt. And again, thank you so much for being here. I often make the joke that every time I have a conversation with someone, once they learn I have a military background, it all of a sudden becomes the elephant in the room. So like, well, until he answers that question, I can't hear anything else he's saying. So really, it's, it's a very interesting, I'll be very short in the time we have. I, I really came to the arts out of, out of my military background, and, and I'm really I was looking for a solution to a problem. Uh, coming out of a, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and many of the deployments I had, and I was uh, serving as a deputy commanding general at Fort Hood. And in training for returning there, I stumbled on a problem uh, by virtue of a, a hearing test that I went to. And one of the technicians, after completing my hearing test, asked me a question about some of the encounters that she were having with some of the service members coming in for their hearing test. And she described a situation where oftentimes she'd be administering the test and everything would go quiet and silent. So she'd get up to go into the booth to see what's going on, think it's a technical problem. And what she found oftentimes was service members would be sitting in the boot weeping and crying. And, and what she was faced with now is how do I advise, how do I counsel them to go and get, you know, the clinical treatment that was so, you know, so much available to them. And many of them did not want to go do that because of, you know, values, leadership reason, didn't want to be seen as weak, you know, the typical military, we serve, don't be served kind of a culture. And so I left that hearing test that day kind of saying, well, how do I, how do I work this? Because I know all of a sudden I potentially had healthy looking individuals standing in my formation ready to go back, but inside they may not have dealt with some of the trauma. So I went looking for a solution, not necessarily in my, directly in my military kit bag, and I ended up on the doorsteps of the arts. And what I found there <clears throat> was an organization that was very interested, innovative, and, and thinking about how they could add value in so many other areas, particularly arts and health. And uh, the Ar Americans for the Arts was one of those, the National Endowment for the Arts was another. But the end of the story sort of is that I ended up on about a decade plus year experience of working with arts organizations throughout this country from Alaska to Florida. And we had the capacity to connect about 11 to 12 uh, military hospitals with some local arts uh, creative therapy programs clinically and also integrating it more into the community. And what I discovered was that this, these were solutions that a lot of military service members really would take advantage of learning how to do creative writing, bending iron, all those different ways of, of creating that they saw a fruitful way to return. You know, there's an expression where I often found they didn't want to think about it in terms of post-traumatic stress. They wanted to think about it in terms of post-traumatic strength. 
how do they regain strength in, in what they're doing? And they wanted to be selective about that and not necessarily having to deal only with the clinical because many of it really wasn't at that level. They just wanted to be able to deal with it and know that they weren't just letting it be pushed pushed forward, so to speak. So that's really how I got here. And uh, in, in many ways, uh, the arts have always been a part of, of my experience in the military. A lot of, a lot of your uh, uh, hearers may not understand that there's a long legacy of history between the arts and the military. For example, George Washington uh, commissioned Cato at Valley Ford. And, and in World War II, we actually had an artist secret battalion that actually went out and created inflatable tanks and other deception tools on the battlefield. And I often tell the story that if I had a chance to get people in the Pentagon nowadays and walk down the corridors, you, you think you're in an art museum because that's how we capture our history and we, we kind of carry it forward in legacy uh, through those, uh, those uh, historical images that, that we so much love. So that's kind of how I got here. It's a lot, a lot more to it, obviously, but in terms of you know, getting the defogging, the reason of why, uh, why one is here, and particularly at this point in time, I think the skills I've had uh, as a military leader, but also in the private sector, I did quite a bit of work in corporate world since I've been out. So it gives me a real good ability to see that. But I think it really that direct engagement with the arts and culture sector for over a decade is really where I, I gained a lot of understanding and knowledge and really excited about all the disciplines of arts and how they contribute, not just to the military community, but all of our communities. And I'll close with this last point because I think the correlation is, I saw it very narrowly in the military, but COVID opened it up in so many other ways. You know, We saw it in our communities now where stress was increasing, loneliness is increasing. Domestic terrorism in our high schools and schools are, are causing kids to see trauma in so many other areas. Our urban areas, you know, many kids walk a gauntlet from home to school every day, you know, of, of, of violence, and they got to figure out how to get through it. And those are traumatic uh, instances where I think arts and health would be a great value uh, to that, which leads to uh, one of those principles that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, if we get a chance to talk about a few of those. <clears throat> Definitely. Absolutely. And in many ways, I think it's a great segue. And, um, and absolutely, thank you for, for sharing that context, because I think it's, it's extraordinarily important. And of course, highlights this, this correlation between arts and healing, arts and wellness, arts and health. Um, and, and all of these programs that you've described that, that have such an impact. And one of the things I would just add that I loved in some, in some of my experiences being able to be involved in some of those programs is that, you know, a lot of times people view the arts and they're like, well, and it's very subjective. And how is this really helping people at uh, the military? is very, very specific and, uh, about things. And so I think it's such a testament to the power of the arts that the military has seen this specific impact uh, on, uh, on you know, the amazing people who, who serve our nation and, and the role of the arts and how um, it actually has a, um, uh, you know, a clinical impact uh, that is beneficial. And I think that has just only further empowered the role that the arts play in so many ways in our nation. So, uh, so thank you so much for sharing that, that context. So also, right, so you're bringing your leadership into Americans for the Arts, literally, right, our nation's organization kind of leading the sense of what the arts are for the nation and, and collaborating with so many other organizations. Um, and in looking at that, um, you kind of develop these, these six principles for transformative change um, and kind of this strategic realignment uh, for the organization. And just wondering if you could, because that not only affects AFTA, but so many other organizations and, um, and individual artists who uh, where the work of AFTA impacts us all. Um, so I was wondering if you could share, and you know, obviously we have a brief time, but are there a couple of these aspects of those principles that for you, you feel are really most important? If we you know, get these right, we're gonna really be on a good track. Yeah, I, I think you, you know, that's so important and, and I appreciate it. Uh, you know, our mission, kind of the core aspect of the mission for the organization is to build recognition and support for that extraordinary value of the arts. arts. And so if I can segue off of that experience I had with the military, you know, most people understand the value of, of the military to our country and its defense. And so we, it's easy to think of the, the military services and many other aspects of our country, homeland defense as, as national assets. You know, uh, FEMA is a national asset because it helps us in the time of crisis and things like that. But as I came out of that experience militarily and then saw what happened in COVID, I realized that uh, the arts are not arts for art's sake, because when you look at how we use the arts in many ways to bring us out of our 
I, I call it uh, COVID caves, right? We all got a chance to reconnect via the arts. And so all of a sudden it dawned on me that there's a national value to the arts in terms of helping us rebuild health, our health security and that whole aspect. So one of the first principles I, I really like to talk about when I go with people is that the arts are a national asset. It isn't just arts for arts. You know, it's arts that can be used everywhere for the value of this nation. And our public health system right now is solely in need. You know, the next uh, one of the next epidemics for our country is going to be loneliness, as is, as is, you know the research indicates to us. And so art is already being used on that uh, end of the spectrum. And then you go all the way to the other side uh, in terms of what we learn in COVID and a lot of our disasters where individuals serving in those roles are now having to deal with trauma in ways that they never imagined. And, and I think this is one of the ways, and I really try to stress that art has always been valuable to us, but now it's, it's touching our whole security in terms of health and many of the ways that I talked about military is helping our defense forces and other uh, forces that are helping us at times of crisis. So that's the first one I think is very important because I think I wanna bring arts out of the shadows of, of being for the elite, being for those parts of the old uh, country that, that don't identify with. This really makes a difference for that frontline cashier that can come out and know inside the community, I can get therapeutic value in, in, in learning how to, to deal with some of the trauma that's going on. The awesome. second one uh, that I think is really important, and I just wanna highlight this as, as the other two, and I'll just name the other four, but it's the fact that the, the impact of the arts at the community level. You know, when you think about it, 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 in COVID hit us all in such a way, and all of a sudden we were worried about how to get food from the grocery stores to the big impacts of our a naval carrier sitting off the coast of, Car uh, of California uh, with, with COVID on, on, on board and, and really not being able to fight, so to speak. Uh, but the point of that is to simply say that cashier that experienced trauma in their community needed to also have a way to go back and deal with it. The separation, you know, the millennial generation saw more separation than they've ever seen in their lives. And so how do they deal with, we know the biggest asset needed during the crisis was psychological uh, or care and treatment. And so I think we just see it as a real valuable asset, but that all makes a difference where? At the community level. Uh, and, and that's the other thing I really stress is that the impact and value of the arts are, are truly at, at, the, at the community community level. And I think the other values that I kind of talk about in these principles, and I'll let you kind of comment that is, is if, if community is where the value of the arts are, are, are at, we need to make sure we're, we're engaging in that community in a way that's most important for us. And I think for Americans for the Arts, that's focusing on our place in a network of networks. We need to understand all those other great things that are going on out there, the other networks that's doing all that great work. And then how do we kind of work in it and be a part of that solar system, you know, not being at the center of it, but helping it advance and go forward. And I love that. Point, Oh, I was just saying, I love that aspect of that and in terms of how you build those networks. And, and in some ways, I think, right, that ties to some of these other uh, additional ones relating to resiliency um, and, uh, and especially trust and equitable and collaborative partnerships. And, uh, and I know we're, we're running short on time, but just wondering that, I think, is often, right, so important in the arts, these kind of equitable collaborative partnerships. Is there a way that you kind of view that specifically for AFTA yes. uh, as it engages? Yes, I think it's specifically through the diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility lens. Because what we also saw with a lot of the social justice movements was that the arts became a place for conversation that we can talk about some of these things that our nation are you know, going through. Uh, and, and I think the way the arts fitted, I, I often make the quote about uh, Amanda Gorman when she was speaking at the inaugural, and she had a, a, a phrase in her poem about our nation at this point in time saying, and she specifically said, and, and I quote, uh, we're, we're not broken, just unfinished. And so I think that when we look at the arts and the way that it can contribute to, to that world, as well as the, the health and well-being of the economy, we've already saw how the arts are in, impacts on the economy. I think we have another way for it to, to benefit the country as well as we go through a lot of the social justice change issues that we're dealing with. And I'm excited that it can become that forum for that process as well. Really, again, within our communities because that's where it is located locally. Awesome, awesome. And then I know that last one about 
how we stay relevant and being prepared. Is there anything that you would share that either you're looking at specifically with AFTA or that you would share to others? Because so many of our audience are leading or in leadership roles of their organizations in the arts ecosystem of, you know, here is a key way or thing that I'm thinking of in terms of staying relevant or being prepared. Is there kind of an aspect that- Yeah, without a doubt. And, and one of the things that we do extremely well here is our research uh, department that we have and, and looking at the whole ecosystem and, and doing research throughout that. One of the things that I found very early on as I was looking at this, that even something like COVID, for example, uh, uh, Bill Gates in 1994 in a TED talk had, had indicated that, hey, I'm not trying to get everybody upset and concerned, but I think we need to start looking at this pandemic concern. And that was in, in 2014. And I think in terms of being ready, my organization need to be looking ahead at those kind of things so that if in fact they are coming, we can start the dialogue within the sector already about that. One of our strengths is convening throughout the art community. And I look forward to bringing leaders together from the art community and talking about well, what, what happens if this kind of thing occurs going forward. We had about one third of our artists that lost employment immediately when COVID happened. Well, that's too big to fail, right? I mean, if you think about it in that term, we want to be thinking about those things that we could legislatively advocate for, begin to talk to our decision makers about so that that impact is not as big as it needs to be. You know, our venues were impacted. That's employment. You know, everybody that works in association with a venue, that's employment again. So we want to be looking ahead at those things. One might say we could have looked at that in 2007 and 2008, right? I mean, that was a major economic downturn. So I want to posture the organization so we are taking that forward look towards those things, but doing it from the community's perspective and all the other leaders and great organizations that we have in the arts sector to help with that. And what you're doing here, let me just say that to you and your readers, they're being informed and, and, and we'll be able to talk about that. So your role even here in helping us to message that is so, so critical. And I'm so grateful for organizations like you, as well as your listeners out there. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but I always like to ask of all my guests, um, you know, you're obviously in this extraordinary leadership role, not just leading a large, you know, staff and team, but all the partnerships and an organization that's, you know, really leading in our field. Um, there's got to be tough days. There's got to be challenging times. And in those as it relates to leadership style and approach, where do you turn, where do you draw upon for strength, for your resilience when times are you know, the toughest? That's a very good point. I'm glad you asked that question because it's really two points very quickly. I, I, I have always led from the perspective that um, if service is beneath you, then leadership is beyond you. And I think at the core of leadership, I, I come from this notion that it's a service ethic that, I, that I'm in it for a reason that's beyond myself. And, and that's kind of really the reason I'm back here is that I saw a moment in time uh, in the arts where I think we, like all organizations now, need to, to learn from what we just went through, but also not see it as a, as a point to stop. And, and service is kind of the key aspect of, of, of doing that. And then finally, I've always looked, and, and maybe just as having grown up in the country and having to work hard all we've ever done, I've always seen, uh, when, when, when a crisis comes, it really is a call out of the ordinary to the extraordinary. And that means we have to give something every day. And there's an extraordinary amount of talent in this sector that, that serves our country and brings value back to it. And, and I think I just would like to be a part of calling us to that extraordinary moment of giving in a way that you can really make the sector grow. So those are really kind of two points of it, service leadership, but also realizing a crisis is nothing but a call out of the ordinary to the extraordinary. And we can do that. You know, our nation has done it over and over again. So many segments have done it. And uh, that's what I think the art sector can offer now. Oh. Nolan Bivens, you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. No, it is my pleasure. And I really am excited about uh, continuing work with you in the future. Thanks to you again and your listeners. Thank you. Thank you.